I went from having really low self-esteem to having a pretty solid one, but it didn't happen overnight. I had to put some work into it. And I'm not talking about the kind of work that would earn me more external success. I'm talking about inner work. In this video, I'm gonna share 10 things I did to build up my self-esteem. Hey you guys, this is part 5 of my video series on identity and worth. If you haven't seen my earlier videos in this series yet, make sure to check them out as well. And if you find this topic and other topics around mental health interesting, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Alright, well let's get started with number 1. Discovering intrinsic worth. I want you to imagine that in front of you, you've got a spread of thin slips of paper. Some of the slips of paper are a little crumpled, some are a little dirty, and some are perfectly crisp and clean. Now if you believe that these slips of paper don't have value on their own, you're more likely to overvalue their visible differences. You might think that the dirty slips of paper have less value than the clean ones. But what if I told you that they're not just any slips of paper? What if I told you that they're all $100 bills? Does a $100 bill that's a little dirty or crumpled have less value than a perfect one? No, it doesn't. The value's still there. And because we're sure of that, most people don't waste their time obsessing over trying to keep all of their money clean and perfect, right? In the same way, I changed how I looked at our worth and value as people. One day, I had a light bulb moment and I finally understood that we have incredible intrinsic worth just as we are. In my last video titled My Most Life Changing Day, I go into greater detail about the day that this perspective came into my life. This newfound perspective made a huge difference in my self esteem. It also freed me up from all those other things that don't matter. Number two, Exposure therapy. The American Psychological Association defines exposure therapy in this way. Basically, you intentionally expose yourself to the things that you fear and avoid. And by doing that, you build up your tolerance and learn for yourself that, hey, it's actually not so bad. In the case of my low self-esteem, one of the things that I feared was not having anything to prove my value and worth as a person, like a well-respected job or achievements. This fear fueled my workaholism for many, many years, but hitting rock bottom at the age of 26, quitting my pursuit of a career in music, and all the years I've been unemployed forced me to face these fears. By the way, I'm definitely not suggesting you quit your job if you already have one right now. I'm just sharing my story, which just happens to be an extreme example. So yeah, that's how I ended up getting my exposure therapy. My psychiatrist would also ask me questions about my thoughts and my feelings as another active way to increase my exposure all from a safe place. Now when I first allowed myself to be exposed to these fears, I would get a million unsettling thoughts. These thoughts would say, you're being so reckless. You're gonna end up becoming nothing but a loser if you don't smarten up and go back to creating your own worth. Your value is in what you do and how well you perform. You need recognition from people to have worth. For so long, these kinds of negative thoughts had bullied me into doing more in order to be enough, preventing me from discovering my intrinsic worth just as I am. So it would make sense to defend myself from these bullies, right? But the problem was, I had been giving in to these bullies for so long that giving in to them would just happen so automatically for me. That needed to change. Which brings me to number three. Deautomatization. You see, there's all these sequences running automatically in the background of our day to day life. Sequences that start with a negative thought and end with a behavior that's no good for our self esteem in the long run. It's these sequences that needed to become less automatic. And I did that by paying closer attention to them and then writing them all down. Some people like to use what's called a CBT thought record, a tool that gives you a template for journaling your unhelpful thoughts. But I just wanted to do everything in my head and then write them all down later. So that's what I did and it worked out great for me. This exercise helped me to become much more aware of these sequences in my life, to the point where I was able to recognize and name the exact negative thought that I was having. I'd be like, oh, that's negative thought number five. Now if you're still having trouble paying attention to your thoughts throughout the day, uh, one thing that helped optimize my awareness was mindfulness meditation. Number four, relapse prevention. In my past video about patterns, addictions, and compulsions, I explained what a relapse is. Now let's say for a good chunk of time, you've been able to refrain from accessing your problematic neural pathways. Did these neural pathways then magically disappear? I mean, I do believe in miracles, but in most cases, no, they stay with you for the rest of your life. They just become dormant. 
These dormant neural pathways are sleeping giants that can be reawakened at full force if you access them again, even a little bit. But stressful times makes it extra challenging to do the right thing that many of us revert back to our old ways and feel stuck all over again. This is called a relapse. Relapses sabotage our progress when it comes to overcoming our problematic patterns. So I knew I had to work on preventing that from happening. So whenever a negative thought about my identity and worth entered my mind, I'd be like, nope, not agreeing with that. And whenever the temptation to create my own worth followed, I'd be like, nope, not gonna do that. I took a very black and white approach to it all. Kind of like how a lot of recovering alcoholics stay away from even having a single sip of alcohol. Next, number five identifying healthier responses. So going back to number three, we've come up with this list of negative thoughts, right? Then at number four, we're like, nope, not agreeing with any of that. Well, if you're not agreeing with that, what are you gonna agree with instead? That's what this part is all about. And so for each negative thought, I had to come up with a better response, a truth that I could agree with that actually makes me let go of control. And so with the help of my church through a counseling ministry called Inner Healing, I came up with a list of healthier truth statements. And the one about my identity and worth went like this. I have incredible value and worth because I am God's beloved and precious son. That never changes, no matter what I do or don't do or how well I do it. God is so proud of me and loves me for who I am. He has his mark of approval on me and that is enough for me. Your truth statement doesn't have to be the same as mine. The important part is that it should be healthier than your original negative one and that it empowers you to let go of control. Number six, creating healthier patterns. So now that you've got a list of healthier responses from number four, what you've got to do is make a new habit out of those responses. After you've identified the patterns in your life that you don't want to be ruled by, you'll have to begin the long and hard process of creating, nurturing, and strengthening other neural pathways, building healthier patterns, all while no longer accessing your problematic ones. This for sure will feel unnatural at first, but you've got to keep at it. Every morning, as soon as I woke up, I read out loud my truth statements. Whenever a negative thought about my identity and worth slipped into my mind, I'd fight back with the opposing truth statement. And I did this all throughout the day and every night before going to bed. I know you might be thinking that this sounds a bit over the top, but what you don't know is how frequently I had these negative thoughts. So if you're not having negative thoughts to the same degree, well then, yeah, I guess you don't have to do it as frequently as I did. The important thing is to at least fight back against your negative thoughts when they do come. Number seven, renewing fondness. Feelings aren't everything, but they do help. Imagine that you've been in a romantic relationship for a while and all the lovey-dovey feelings have diminished. Is it even possible to bring back such positive feelings for your partner? Yes, of course it is. We've just got to continue to act out of love towards our partner despite the lack or absence of feelings. And then feelings do have a way of coming back. This is the same for our relationship with ourselves. So I became much more intentional about acting out of love toward myself. This does not mean being more selfish. One simple way I loved myself was by being more active in giving myself compliments and receiving it, not swatting it away, and really receiving words of affirmation from others as well. And as I did that, I began to like myself more and more. Similar to number seven is number eight, self-improvement. In a very grace-giving way, not in a military drill sergeant kind of way, I invested my time and energy into becoming the best version of myself on the inside because I'm worth it. Still to this day, I continually pick up and work on different inner work projects to improve myself more and more. And I don't plan on ever stopping, not until the day I die. It just feels really good to set goals, work hard, and enjoy the results. Kind of like making a habit of going to the gym and working out, but this part is not not about creating your worth. It's just about feeling good about yourself and building up your confidence in taking on these kinds of personal projects. Number nine, positive self-discovery through introspection. I don't care who you are, where you're from, or what you've done, I believe all of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. I believe there's so much beauty in each and every one of us that even a lifetime is not long enough to fully take in all the beauty there is to one person. But we can still try to get somewhat of a picture of who we are in our fullness. And so still to this day, because of my belief, because of my curiosity, and because of my appreciation 
for beauty, I continue to discover and be in awe of all these positive qualities that make up who I am. And as this positive picture of who I am becomes clearer to me, my self-esteem just keeps on rising as well. As a Christian, one of the things I do is ask God to show me how he sees me through his eyes. And one of the ways I've tried listening to God's response is by holding up a pen against a notepad and without thinking too much, without dissecting the whole process and dismissing it all as my own wishful thinking, just writing to myself as if God is speaking to me. Some of my most uplifting love letters have been birthed out of this kind of spiritual exercise. But discovering our best selves on our own has its limitations. After all, we're only human. We all have our blind spots due to our limited awareness. And that's why we need one another. Which brings me to number 10 positive self-discovery through relationships. I spent more time around people who not only share the same beliefs with regards to intrinsic worth, but also care to build others up. And I found and connected with a lot of people like that in the church. In my church, it's actually so normal for people to see the amazing way that God has created each of us and then to share that with one another. So that positive picture of who I am became even more clear as I put together all the different perspectives from all the different kinds of people coming from different walks of life. But even more than these relationships, there's one relationship that trumps them all when it comes to showing you the truth about who you are. And it has this power because you know one another so intimately. Marriage. Timothy Keller says that a positive assessment by your spouse has ultimate credibility. He also says that the power of love is marriage's capacity for reprogramming your self-image, redeeming the past, and healing your deepest hurts. Wow, isn't marriage friggin' awesome? So that's 10 things I did to build up my self-esteem. It wasn't easy, but it was definitely worth it. And it's my hope that you can also live with the freedom that comes from really knowing your worth. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.